Hi, good evening, Malaysia and followers from around the world. Tonight, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Go Mien Kiet or MK, who is the CEO of Carex Berhad, which is the world's largest condom maker. Carex Berhad began as a small family business in 1988 in Johor. But today, it has become the world leader in condom and lubricant manufacturing with operations in the US, UK, Thailand, and of course, Malaysia. And he has clients in over 130 countries. That's how big Karas Berhad is. MK, welcome on board. Can you take us on the company journey before we go into the questions? MK, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chun Wai. Uh, well, family was started by my late grandfather in 1988 together with my father and my uncle. Uh, it was a family-run business. Um, my family has been in the rubber business for, well, I'm the fourth generation in this rubber business. We were previously from rubber processing, and I guess my grandfather has always been um, sort of, uh, you know, managing a commodity-run business is very difficult. So he wanted to get into a finished product and that was a time when HIV AIDS was big in the 80s it was yeah. was a pandemic back then right and it still is um, and you know we need we knew that we had to go into a, a product so we went into condoms um, and that's how we got into the business so that's where we bought one machine and finally continued to grow within this business um, and one day we realized that we became the largest condom maker in the world so at, at what point did you felt that, look, um, uh, this is it. You know that we have been doing this uh, rubber brother uh, uh, producing and that I know that at that point you have this AIDS uh, situation which was already uh, climbing up in the 80s. At what point did you felt that, look, uh, we have got to uh, divest our usual uh, rubber business and that there would have been many competitors at that point? Uh, well... It was a very early at the stage. I was a young kid, I guess, back then. Um, and my, I always remember my father telling me that, you know, your grandfather couldn't sleep yesterday night. Uh, you know, he was looking at the, uh, you know, the New York uh, Commodity Exchange. And you look at the pricing and, you, you know, you could just lose off everything. And it was yeah. probably a crisis in the 88 crisis, the commodity crisis that led to, um, you know, my grandfather making, you know, the decision and say, that's it, you know, let's, really move into a final product and basically get into a product where you can actually determine your own fate. Because the, the thing is that when you're sometimes in a commodity business, um, you can be doing well, but you know, commodity price can just hit you overnight and that's it. MK, uh, when I look through the, the financial results of uh, your company, uh, it seems to fluctuate at times. Uh, it was down a bit uh, in over last, last one year, but it has gone up again in uh, 2020. The fluctuation, is it because of the um, lack of support from governments which form some of your biggest uh, clientele? Is it because that they have sort of a lost support for HIV and AIDS uh, campaign? Well, I guess to a certain extent, yes. Um, what we've been seeing in this industry is, uh, you know, the last three years is what I would say um, a, 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 you know, the industry came to a junction and we need to realize and see what how the industry is moving forward. Um, you know, globally, uh, we always say that almost 50% of condoms around the world are purchased by governments around the world. Uh, and that was uh, the response towards HIV AIDS. So what happened is that um, in the last few years, there's been quite a number of change where um, I think one of the, the areas that uh, a lot of the donor uh, money um, actually had sort of had to be relooked because of the humanitarian crisis, such as the refugee crisis uh, due to the war in Syria. So we have been seeing, you know, migration of millions of refugees this time into Europe. And billions of euro has been spent um, to keep uh, the refugees safe in Europe. And the money had to be diverted from somewhere. And I think it's also a time where, um, you know, HIV AIDS needs to be relooked at. It is still affecting over 2 million new infections yes. every year. But I guess it's no longer a death sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is 
no cure, but there is treatment available. So, um, and it's also time where economies has changed because 30 years ago, you know, Africa was very different. Today, Africa mm -hmm. is totally different and they can afford to buy their own condoms. So mm -hmm. I think it's um, definitely a game changer with governments moving away, but I'm really excited for the future because I think, um, you know, when government pulls out, that means the commercial market will continue to grow and uh, it will probably grow even much, much larger than before. Mm. Has there been a reduction in the supply of uh, condoms worldwide? And this uh, may help the Carex to have profits uh, in the uh, coming years? Is there a reduction of condoms? I would say that, um, you see, unfortunate because of the government sector. So what happens is that um, we sometimes do not know what is the real demand at times. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, here in Malaysia, if you need to buy a box of condom, it comes in a box of three, in a box of 12, and you buy what you need. But if you're in Africa, um, if, you get, uh, if you get your allocation of condoms, you will get um, up to 500 condoms every three months. So the amount that is actually given, with, and the question is whether you use it or not, um, they would, you would get that sort of allocation. So of course, in the past, um, the, you know, when governments were buying them, uh, you know, the amount can be very big. But now when governments are slowly pulling back, uh, even people in developing countries now have to buy their condoms. So they will only buy what they need. Um, mm. I don't see there's a trend in terms of condom usage. Mm -hmm. There will be lesser waste stages, which is great. Uh, and you know, when, once there is later, you know, less waste stage, so people will invest in terms of buying uh, more premium products. So they will go into more textured condoms, more flavored condoms, or more ultra thin. So you know, they, they have now their choice, basically. When you mentioned that uh, they, they give you a, a box of 500 uh, condoms, do they mean that uh, the government gives it to an NGO or a village, but definitely not an individual, right? I mean, they give it to... Uh, who who gets the 500? Individual. Individual? Who, yeah. who, who will use 500 condoms? <laughs> well, in Africa, I, I don't know. The usage of condoms are, are, are huge. So that's why sometimes I always joke with my friends. I say, you know, um, here in Malaysia, when we, we look at the stats or the results and say that, oh, you know, we're actually active than our neighbors, we feel very <laughs> proud. But I say, you know, don't measure yourself to Africa. We, we, we don't know where to put our faces. <laughs> you know that, um, um, what do you call it, that um, when you mention Africa, so which uh, will be your largest uh, market in terms of countries? Well, I would say that... Um, you know, population. Um, Nigeria has a third of the African population. So definitely Nigeria. Uh, South Africa is, is actually very large as well because uh, they've got a very big uh, market in, in South Africa. Um, you know, government, uh, you know, government programs. Uh, even a country like Namibia, um, where we supply condoms to, they have a population of below 2 million. But they would buy over 20 million to 30 million condoms a year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the amount of condoms there is, is big. Um, you know, I've personally been there. The first thing, once I came out from university in the early 2000, year, year 2000, I think that was one of my first posting mm -hmm. uh, to go, go and get sales. I was actually in Uganda okay. um, and Tanzania. So those were the areas and it, it's really different because... Here, you know, you, you don't really know a person who is really living with HIV AIDS yeah. and it's not very common. But when you're at the point of time when I was in Africa or in Uganda at that point of time, a third of the population is HIV infected. So it's actually uh, very serious, um, you know, and of course, I look at it as a, a sheet of condom. Mm -hmm. But when you're in Africa, it's a life-saving tool. So in Africa, it will not just be a matter of selling condoms. It has got to come with an edu educational program to tell them, look, you need to use condom. So yep. uh, who would run this uh, uh, education campaign? Is it with the support of your company, with the government or with MGO? Who does it? Oh, it's basically a lot of government uh, who is supporting all this. Um, so if you look into um, United Nations, uh, United Nations runs uh, quite a major programs in terms of supply. 
but it's a lot of the NGOs that are actually running this program. So you have uh, programs, uh, NGOs such as Population Services International, or we call them PSI, uh, DKT, uh, Mary Stokes uh, International, which is a UK base, and they would get a lot of funding um, from the US government, uh, EU governments, um, and of late, there's been a lot of philanthropies that's also coming out with support. Um, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a major supporter of the HIV, global HIV AIDS program as well. So which means that in the cities in these uh, countries, if they live in a the city, they would just go, go to the shop and buy like in Malaysia. And mm -hmm. if they're living in the rural areas, it will be the NGO or um, government who would supply these uh, condoms to them. Am I right? Almost, I would say almost 95 to over 95% of condoms in, in those African countries are almost given up for free. So, so it's free. Um, free. So if you walk into a, um, if you walk into any uh, government clinics or even government offices uh, in Africa, uh, you would go to the male toilet and you will mm -hmm. find boxes of condoms there, okay. uh, like tissue paper. You, oh. You'll find like tissue paper here and you can take whatever you want. Um, oh. So happened, I was actually speaking to a very senior um, uh, officer at Kazana one day and they were, I think they were in Ghana. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they had a meeting there and they, they went to the toilet and he actually told me, he says, you know what, I went to the toilet, I didn't see anything, but I saw this word says Carex Fontaine. Oh. Okay. You know, and, you know, he was he was impressed because the fact that he was in the middle of somewhere in Africa, so remote, mm -hmm. and um, he saw a Malaysian made product in the offices there. So mm -hmm. you know that was a moment that I, I guess you know made me proud as well. You know, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, something that you don't expect. Yes. In terms of uh, your competitors, what countries uh, are they located in? Well. Um, I would say that Thailand, Thailand is actually a major competitor today uh, due to the fact that Thailand is today the largest uh, rubber producer in the world. Okay. Um, and China is actually uh, quite a large producer. And the I fact see. that why China is also because of, uh, you know, pre historically because of their one child policy. Yeah. Uh, and also due to the fact that population, you know, is the most populous country in the world. Obviously, the need for condoms is large in, in, yeah. in China. Uh, same goes with India as well. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, India, uh, China are major producers. Uh, we have a few producers. We find some in Japan, um, but the Japanese tends to be very niche. They mm. tend to be very thin condoms. Um, I see. They, they have a, a very own market itself. And... I always say that uh, one of the largest of per capita usage of condoms, highest in the world, used to be Japan. I see. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting as condom makers, we always look at the Japanese market to learn quite a few things from Japan because um, Japan did not allow the use of contraceptive pills until much, much later. So condom was almost the only method of contraception uh, available in Japan. So I will presume that in a case of uh, the Indian and Chinese competitors, they would have to import this raw material, rubber material, to have it manufactured in these two countries. Uh, mainly more for China, but India has their own plantation. Ah, so okay. if you look at the southern part of India, I think India is one of the top five uh, producing countries of rubber as well. So uh, India do have their own materials. I see. Now, um, how do uh, your, co your company uh, become the uh, biggest uh, condom uh, manufacturer? And when you tell people that, look, uh, we are the largest uh, manufacturer, are they surprised that, look, Malaysia is a conservative country and that uh, Malaysia is uh, doing so well through your company to be the flag bearer in terms of condom manufacturing? Are they surprised? Yeah, I think there is a lot of surprise. Um... You know, people think that uh, you are in a Muslim country. You know, mm -hmm. you uh, you know you don't talk even about condoms. Um, yeah. But how how did we become the world's largest condom maker? Um, I, I guess a lot of uh, uh, you know experience in rubber has helped us initially with the initial uh, you know start in getting into condoms. But 
how did Carex actually became the largest? Um, we we actually built our own machines, uh, Chinwai. So okay. if you would come down to our factory one day, you'll actually look at all those machines and they were all self-fabricated. So, um, you know, we started very tough in this condom business. Um, in fact, at the point of time, uh, you know, my family lost everything just to support the business that the factory was my house. Um, oh. So it was it was tough. Uh, I, I I worked there uh, as a kid. You know, I always say tell people I'm, I was one of the child labor there uh, of Carex. Um, and you know, we had to we had to do many things, and we had to innovate this business because you see, you know, condom has been around for over a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not until the 1950s where they learned how to lubricate a condom. Mm-hmm. So before 1950s, condoms were not lubricated. So, you know, I always have this joke as says, I cannot imagine how many women was, was probably screaming <laughs> then, <laughs> you know, but then we realized that because of HIV AIDS, the condoms became more and more popular. Uh, and to attract people coming to use condoms, that's when you start to make condoms with colors and you flavored the condoms, you texturize the condoms. Um, and that was when people started to come to us and they asked me and says, hey, you know, in the early days, my uncle, they asked my family and says, can you make me a condom that glows in the dark? You know, uh, can you make me a condom that changes color? So I remember when I was a kid back then, I was in the factory and I was one of my projects that I was sort of looking at was, you know, uh, we were producing a color changing condom. Mm-hmm. It was uh, the first dip you dip in a purple colored uh, in a purple color latex and the next one was with this chemical that changes color when it becomes hot ah. so, uh, then you know when it becomes hot it just turns transparent so the purple color comes out so it gives you the fact that you know it, it's changing in color so there was people who came to us and you know asked me and says you know those days where um, you know MC Hammer was popular back then um, mm. and says, can you make me a condom like MC Hammer's pants <laughs> That's really big. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, it, it became really like a, a fashion. You, you know, you, it, people wanted to innovate because what I've seen in the, uh, in the 90s was a revolution, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, condom was moving, slowly moving from a safety product and moving to a pleasure product. Mm-hmm. So that was when, uh, you know, what we have done is just basically say yes to all the customers and say, yes, we can do it for you because we built the machines and the fact that, okay, all we need to do is just change this, change that, we can make something different. Um, so that whole entrepreneurial spirit came in and basically we just continued with it. Uh, we're very focused in terms of um, building volume as well at the point of time. We, uh, the fact that we can make our own machines, it was cheap, you know, so we, we had to make machines that are simple enough that you know, our workers know how to use them because you know, it's really no point like yeah. going to buy a German machine with all these buttons, but you know, your workers don't understand them. So uh, the, the secret was just make sim- simple enough products, people understand how to make it. And when it's simple enough, it's how do you replicate and make sure that this model can, can expand. So we expanded on that model and um, finally one day we just realized that one in every five condoms in the world is made by us now. I see. Well done. Thank you. MK, uh, who were these early clients who want these uh, condoms that glow in the dark and that can change color? Were they uh, local or were they foreigners? Foreigners. I see. Um, the Americans were very, very innovative. They mm. um, wanted something different uh, because you know, you, uh, some of the Europeans as well, uh, they, because, you know, they were the early ones who was exposed to mm-hmm. all this new technology and they wanted something different. Um, so that's when they came and says, oh, you can make a color, uh, a condom that glows in, at night. Uh, it was interesting, uh, especially during Star Wars period, you know, I the up condoms was many people's lightsabers. Mm. So would, are, are, are these condoms, these glow the dark condoms, are they just a novelty or they're actually a big volume of, uh, what they call it, the seals from this type of condoms? Um, it started as a novelty. Mm-hmm. But what we did was uh, we made sure that it, we commercialized it. Um, mm-hmm. And they were, 
uh, we, we saw some of this, you could probably find sometimes those uh, glow in the dark in some of those uh, condominium shops around the world, right? And mm -hmm, the, okay. a lot of them were novelty. But what we invested was we, we really looked at the whole manufacturing process and we made the first FDA approved glow in the dark condoms. Um, and initially, when we were first discussing this with uh, our client back then, it was only mm -hmm. looking at a projection of a million condoms. Mm -hmm. I think we have done maybe over 20 million condoms wow. of, yeah, of those glow in the dark. So it's not really novelty anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a product that it's, it's, it's used um, you know, for, for fun, I guess. Uh, but it's it feels, feels. thing, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's something that uh, spice up, you know, your, yeah. your whole sexual experience. So MK, I've read that you also produce uh, this kind of a novelty kind of condoms for Malaysians. You have uh, rendang, right? Uh, yeah. What else? You have rendang. You have uh, uh, nasi lemak. Nasi lemak. Yes. Okay. Uh, we we launched um, the first one. Actually, we launched was a durian flavored condom. Okay. Yeah. Then um, we went to nasi lemak, and then we did one with teh tarik um, because we felt that Malaysians, you know, like to have their mama time and you know their lepak time with uh, teh tarik, and then we went to do rendang flavored last year, uh, and we'll continue to sort of localized certain, certain flavors. Uh, we've done all these flavors for quite a number of countries. In fact, one that actually inspired me to do that was the fact that I made a, a marijuana flavored condom oh, okay. in, in Holland. Okay. Uh, it was, it's not the real marijuana. I'll be arrested in the case. Uh, it's synthetic it's marijuana. Um, then we, we did some for our Indonesian customers as well. We did durian and Mm. It's very interesting, in fact, um, and I felt that, you know, Malaysians are a bunch of people that, uh, you know, they're shy uh, when it comes to talking about condoms. And I personally, you know, been to multiple events at times. Sometimes you go to an event, you sit with, you know, a bunch of people on a round table and they, then they start asking, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and then, um, the next thing you say is I'm making condoms. Uh, you know, sometimes people hear me and say, oh, you're building condominiums. <laughs> So, you know, and then, then they realize, oh, you know, I've asked the wrong question. You know, of course, there are a lot of people who are more intrigued with what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. and that's where all the questions start to come in. But generally, I would say that, um, you know, it's, I, I think condoms around the world, um, it, it's still a taboo, uh, you know, like it or not. Um, people find that it's not very easy to talk about. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, condom is one where uh, almost it's, you know, statistics wise, if you walk and you talk to someone in the supermarket, uh, it's the high, it's the one that is most highly shoplifted. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So much so that uh, people put condoms behind the glass counters. And yeah. then, you know, you look into it and say, who the hell would then buy in front of, uh, you know, gotcha. behind a glass counter, you have to call yeah. a assistant come and open that and yeah. you know I, I, I want to come down so uh, but it's it's proven and the fact that when people buy condoms here even here in Malaysia I say they have this you know like eagle mentality you know you walk into a pharmacy you will you will glance your surrounding first you see it if there's people before you go into the aisle the next thing if once you go you grab it you go to the counter you pay for it right so it's something which I feel that, you know, it's a life-saving product. And I always yeah. believe that it's really no different than a chewing gum. You know, it's, it's a rubber in a box, that's it, right? Um, and to me, I feel that if a person is using them, I, you know, my own personal belief is that, you know, you're being responsible, at least you're thinking about your partner. Uh, so the thing here is that, um, how do you encourage people to talk about it? Because it's stigma that is actually killing people because you know yes. there's two million new infections because people are not using condoms they're not using the right protection and why is because they're being stigmatized mm. so i felt that um by creating local flavors um you know you sort of de-stigmatize the whole condom use so you know you could have a conversation now you know people would have a friend you know and say yeah. have you heard about that nasi lemak condom and everybody would have a laugh about it you know but you know, you are able to then have a conversation. conversation. Yeah. yeah. Without that conversation, um, a condom will always be a condom in 
that owl that nobody wants to talk about. So, um, MK, MK, do you have an R and D department if you want to do a research and to carry out a product test on, say, nasi lemak, teh tarik, durian, and rendang? Do you have a special unit that sort of like go through this and say, okay, we have come to this. This is the right one. Uh, well, the branding and the sales teams are one that are testers as well. Um, you know, we've got great uh, team of people who are very sporting that's always uh, wanting to try out. Um, ideas are usually coming out from the team. Uh, they're coming out from uh, consumers. Um, it's sometimes coming even from uh, you know, uh, consumer responses to us um, in terms of what, what we can do or how they can improve the product. So we do have an R&D team, a full-fledged R&D team in our factories where what their role is really to look into the more scientific perspective of the material, to look at uh, you know, the raw materials. Um, but the fun part about you know, launching things like Nasi Lemak is then you, you sort of get the entire team involved, mm -hmm. which is sales and branding team, the marketing team all gets involved. So... Um, yeah, you know, all of us would be smelling condoms, would be putting condoms in our mouth, uh, you know, we're all having good fun sometimes about it. Um, so it's, 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 it's where it all starts, actually. So MK, in terms of uh, the number one product in this uh, Malaysian series, I would call it, uh, which comes up the best? Durian, Nasi Lemak, Teh Tarik and Rendang, which one is the best selling of the four? Um, I would still say Nasi Lemak. I see. Um, Nasi Lemak had huge press for us. Um, even in fact, I was reading, I think it was on the BBC, and they, they did a literal translation. They call it fatty rice flavored, oh. uh, fatty rice flavored condom, which, which definitely sound wrong. Uh, you know, it's, it's not Nasi Lemak, <laughs> you know, but um, it had a lot of people talk about it mm -hmm. because what we did was not just, just the flavor, but we made the condom hot. So there was a warming lubricant inside. Um, I see. Okay. So you know, it's uh, it's not just a condom. You know, a condom really has so much elements when you look at a condom. It's not just about the color or the scent, but um, the sensory feel of it is mm. now where um, people are now starting to put cooling lubricants, warming lubricants. But you know, when I talk to people and say it's a warming lubricant, a lot of people don't understand what a warming lubricant is because people will say. It's why do I want to feel it warm down there, right? But then suddenly when you tell them about nasi lemak or rendang and you say, mm. oh, you're going to feel like a rendang is going in there, right? Mm. And then, uh, you know, then that's where people have that laugh and they would have the conversation. And then that's when we can actually tell them and explain to them why um, it will feel more natural, uh, probably with a uh, warming. So the same... Uh, in down, down in uh, Singapore, you export to Singapore as well, right? Um, not yet of the Malaysian favorite ones. Uh, they are our distributors are definitely thinking about something for Singaporeans. They are thinking, they're trying to uh, build their own, uh, you know, local flavors. Mm. So I don't know which one they want to choose or mm. which one they want or which one they want to place take first. Yeah. Tell me about your production facilities in outside uh, uh, Malaysia, in Malaysia and outside Malaysia. Um, well, our largest plan actually is right now in Hajai, is mm -hmm. in Thailand, in south of Thailand. Um, we have three locations here in Malaysia. Uh, we actually started uh, in eight, 1988 in Johor Bahru. Uh, I'm a Johorian myself. Okay. Um, and we then moved down to Pontian. Uh, we closed down the factory in JB because the cost was too expensive in JB. Um, and we have been in Pontian now for over 26 years. And um, from there, uh, we acquired a German company, uh, Biosdorf, uh, you know, the company that makes Nivea creams and Hansaplast. So they had, a, they had a factory in Johor in Sinai, and we bought that over about four years ago. Then um, we had a factory, and I'm actually based in the Port Klang factory uh, mm -hmm. here in Selangor. Um, and from there, we expanded in 2005 to Hajai and we are expanding our facility in Hajai because partly the fact that you know raw materials are very easily yeah. available in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, uh, other facilities that are mainly the US and the UK facilities are mainly more in terms of packaging. 
because um, we do a lot of products where we supply the NHS, the National Health Services in the UK, um, and they are being uh, packed all in the UK. Uh, and the US is packed for the US market uh, for the Planned Parenthood clinics and to the health clinics in, in the US and also to supply to all our uh, clients in the US. MK, coming back to uh, condom as a product, I mean, we can talk about uh, glow the dark, we can talk about Natsalama, but the main criteria for most users would be to have it as thin as possible and yet at the same time to make sure it doesn't leak. So how do you ensure and keep up with this trend, decreasing thickness and ensuring safety? A lot of R&D work has been put into it, um, you know, looking into the raw the material itself. Um, today, the thinnest condom that we make, it's already half the thickness of your hair. I see. Um, you know, your hair, an average hair is about 70 microns, uh, 75 microns. And... Today, uh, the thickness that we, the thinnest we go now is in a range of 35 to 38 microns. Um, there is a lot of tests that need to be done uh, to ensure that it's safe, that it will not burst during use. And it's not just sometimes about the raw material itself. It's also in terms of lubrication. How do you get the lubrication all the way throughout, evenly distributed throughout the condom? Um, and, um, you know, Physical testings are very important. So uh, before a product is being put into the market, uh, you need to test them, you need to air inflate them. So a typical condom, even if you're looking at an ultra thin, would have almost up to over 35 liters of air that you can fit in a condom. So you can imagine it's really, really big. Um, you know, it can actually even fit an elephant uh, oh. sometimes, uh, you know, if you think about that. Uh, so it's, it's huge. Um, and we have to do a lot of study so you can't just put a market because condom is a medical device and it's not just any medical device it's the highest non-medicated medical device mm -hmm. uh, it's a class 2b medical product so um, that's where you need to uh, get the products and you know you have a shelf life of five years uh, you know condom has a shelf life of five years so you need to test them and make sure that it it's able to withstand uh, all these tests. Um, and one of the, the, the toughest tests that we would do is that we will put a condom in an oven for oh. months at 50 degrees. And we'll take all that out and we'll test them again. Uh, after six months, we'll see if the physical pass or not. So only when it passes, the product can put onto the shelf. So it's very stringent. Uh, users will always want their condoms to be as thin as possible. But uh, have you heard of this paradoxical uh, situation where men want it thin, but at the same time, they want to be doubly sure and they wear double layer? Is there such a thing? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a bad thing if you wear double condom. In fact, um, you know, if you wear two sheets of condom, uh, I can assure you that it will break faster than using just one layer. I see. Okay. Yeah. Why, Why is, is that it so? Yeah, yeah it's because uh, when you have two, two rubber rubbing two together, you'll get more friction. I the see. friction okay. will actually break the rubber. I see. Yeah, so I always tell people, don't use two layers of rubber. In mm. fact, when we make a, a condom, there is a minimum of two layers of rubber there already. So we already made two rubber for you. It's a, it's a laminate. Uh, we already have done two layers there. So don't wear two more layers. MK, you know that this uh, product is so unusual where, um, for example, in Malaysia, we are, we are a very conservative country. Uh, Malaysia, we have the largest condom manufacturing plant, and yet at the same time, the regulators do not allow the, the advertising of condom in uh, print media, and I'm not too sure about online, but yep. uh, so how do you, uh, brands like you uh, promote or to sell it? Do you need to do branding or to advertise in other countries, and do they have regulators like in Malaysia? Yeah, actually, um, I don't think Malaysia is the strictest. Um, in fact, actually, Thailand is even more strict. Um, with with even condoms, you know, uh, to think about, we think that Thailand is so liberal, yeah. Um, because it's a medical device. I think how mm. they look at it, it's a medical device. Um, and when you sometimes advertise on medical devices, there are rules and regulations because it's safe. It cannot be safer. If you say it's safer, it has to be 
backed by a clinical data or clinical study. So, um, you know, I, I think where we have to put in sometimes our uh, advertising is um, not through the direct way of a print media, but um, I think it's through our innovations where, you know, when we make, let's say, a nasi lemak condom, mm -hmm. uh, a down flavored condom, that's when people get excited. Yeah. That's when media will cover for, for us. Um, and that's when it's, it, it's a time that basically you can put in or you can then associate it with, you know, uh, things like World AIDS Day, mm -hmm. uh, where you can talk a lot more about condoms in the perspective of HIV AIDS. But sometimes I also don't like to just only talk about HIV AIDS because mm -hmm. you don't want to scare people to use a condom. You want yes. people to use it because of pleasure, not because of fear. What about in the Philippines? I know that you know you have this uh, very conservative Catholic uh, background there, eh, where yep. they don't encourage the use of contraceptive, and yet the population is really exploding in the Philippines. Uh, how do your guys uh, promote this product in the Philippines? Uh, in Philippines, we have actually been working with the NGOs, um, and we know that it's it's very tough in in Philippines. They always come to tell us how tough it is because when they come out with a program. Um, it's the church, it's not the regulators, it's the church that, 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 that clamps them down. And the pressure that the church puts sometimes would stop certain retailers from even pulling out the products off the shelves. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, it's a product where you want people to have it, but it, it has to be very subtle in terms of branding and marketing. At times, in certain markets, um, you cannot just be shouting all the time. You, you need mm -hmm. to be very, and I think it's, Today, you can be very tactical, uh, targeted in terms of your advertising. Uh, and I think the great thing about online media today is the fact yeah. that you know, with the use of social media, you could now target uh, the users uh, better. Yeah. Uh, since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we had this MCO, has it affected your production and supplies? It has affected um, supply chain for sure. Uh, it affected us uh, from the moment MCO was was announced, from the 18 all the way the the half well half of half of March we had to shut down the factory, um, and then we got the DMT approval, um, but we only got to run at 50% capacity, so we were running 50 capacity 50% 50 capacity for the entire month of April, and then only came May uh, things started to slowly come back. But when we start to come back as well, um, you know, our suppliers, not all of them were back yet. So See. some of them were still um, slowly coming back. And you can imagine it was very difficult times uh, to manage. Uh, and we don't realize how important supply chains are because we always have taken that sort of for granted that, you know, make a phone call, your paper box will come, your raw materials will come. But then suddenly you realize that Mm. It, myself, when I leave my home, it's, I feel like, you know, I've, I have to go through multiple roadblocks and, you know, explaining to the police about, you know, why you need to go to the office. How many workers do you have in Malaysia and around the world? Uh, across, we have today over 3,300 employees. Mm. So in terms of uh, this COVID-19 situation, have you started to move away from, move on to other products like... Uh, uh, sanitization and uh, perhaps even uh, we 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 did very immediate was uh right at covid was uh we started our sanitizer uh mm -hmm. factory uh well we we had already actually the tanks and all that when we've been making um we've been making lubricant so it's almost the same facility and we have all the uh tubing and the uh bottling bottling facility so one thing that we did was you know well i think what's important is how do you respond to your community yeah. uh, who is in need of certain materials? And that's what we did was we quickly came up with a sanitizer. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, we had the use of uh, alcohol as well. So we look at it, we had a lot of raw materials to make a hand sanitizer. So, you know, we, we, we think that that was the right thing to do at that point of time. Um, mm -hmm. We proceeded with the project. So that's and, where uh, we came with hand sanitizers and uh, and of late as well, I think the next thing that we announce as well is to go into gloves. So gloves is another response that we think that uh, will help us um, 
improve our offerings uh, as an organization. So while I think Carex is known very much as the largest condom maker in the world, uh, but we are also into uh, other uh, medical devices as well. So one of the things that we do um, quite a bit is we produce uh, Foley balloon catheters. So uh, a Foley catheter is basically, I guess, when you see a person coming out from hospital or during hospitalization, you, you see a urine bag when a person doesn't go to the toilet. So we make that tube that connects the back and your into directly into your bladder. So it's an internal tube that goes into the body. So that's a, a part of medical device that we, we manufacture. And it's also part of the uh, sort of products that we've been doing for probably over the last 20 years. Um, the other products that we do as well is that um, we do a lot of probe covers. And um, we have actually been seeing quite a number of increase in probe cover use of late. Um, Sorry, what cover is this? Probe covers. Uh, probe. So they are basically used by gynecologists. Um, I see. Uh, many years ago, a lot of doctors have been using condoms uh, to cover these uh, ultrasonic probes. Oh, I see. Okay. By gynecologists, uh, when you know those machines are probably over a million ringgit, and you mm. know when you do an ultrasound probe, you want to cover you want to cover the machine because you, mm -hmm. you, you know you don't want to dirty the machine. Okay. Uh, the person who uses it will be easy to just change that, and uh, of course, if it's the probes are now changing in sizes um, and you want a actual proper cover that covers the machine. So a lot of these uh, probe uh, manufacturers come to us to make the covers. So we've been doing quite a bit of that. And of course, one of the things we realized as well is that a lot of doctors are now starting to use that to cover their stethoscopes hmm. because of COVID as well. Uh, yes, um, yes. They want to cover uh, the stethoscope so that the next person they, they touch with, you know, hmm. will be sort of clean and they don't have to sanitize it. Hmm. So, um, and the next thing, you know, we also realized that, you know, conduct, glove is uh, a, a potential item. Um, yes. A lot of people have been asking me, why are we not doing gloves? For the fact hmm. that it's medical, it's, it's a dipping process. Um, you know, you are, you are, we're familiar with it. In fact, glove is actually a lower classification of medical device. Uh, it's only hmm. a one, so it's actually two levels lower than a condom. So the certification is much easier to achieve. Um, and actually, Carex started in 88 with actually the intention at first to mm. uh, start with a glove line, but we didn't activate it. Mm. Uh, we, had our, uh, we also had our uh, distributors, our own office in UK that is distributing gloves as well. So we thought it was a, probably a right time now um, to sort of diversify the... Uh, to increase or enhance the medical business of Carex. MK, I, uh, you know, like Carex, uh, which uh, had gone on to uh, glove manufacturing at one point and then sort of uh, stop it. There are a lot of other uh, tycoons in town which also started their rubber glove uh, factory years ago and they yeah. found that the, the profit margin was actually very low. Is that the reason why many of you guys said, okay, let's put a stop to it? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's definitely at the point of time margins um, mm. actually been very low, but I think one of the areas that I've looked at uh, at the glove uh, uh, industry is that it's, it's always been, you know, the big utilization of glove has always been in hospitals. Mm. Uh, but one of the areas I think would definitely see a change post-COVID um, would be how this product would be a lot more... Uh, not all of it, but a, a portion of this business will be skewed towards a consumer product. Yes. Um, you know, like it or not, we would next time, even after COVID, might have face masks in our house. Yes. We would use hand sanitizers more, more often. Mm -hmm. And we have a box of, of gloves at home because we do not know when we will, will need to use right. it. Um, hygiene is, is, is important. So that's where... Um, you know, Carex definitely is, uh, you know, growing within the consumer business. Uh, and we understand the consumer business well enough yeah. that we'll focus part of the business. So, you know, our intention is not to be a large glove player, but we believe that, um, you know, the glove facility will enhance our existing product range in, 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 in medical business. And also to then focus also on 
the consumer side of gloves, uh, which we believe that there is a lot and huge opportunity to grow there. Uh, so MK, what is the CSR uh, functions in your company? Well, um, you can see that we work with a lot of HIV AIDS uh, you know, organizations with the NGOs. Um, and over the years, I myself, um, you know, you know, it's it's very it's it's a topic that's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. so what I've done uh, is that, you know, we have actually started um, a program in Malaysia called Arts Against AIDS. Uh, this year will be our sixth year running the you know Arts Against AIDS. So what I've done is that, um, you know, I think from the topic that we have spoken earlier about education and you know Malaysia being a conservative country, what what do we do? Um, so we have been running a program with art students. Uh, we go to universities and we get them to join our Arts Against AIDS mm -hmm. uh, uh, competition where uh, you know, the students will win something at the end of it. And we will auction off all these paintings uh, for, for sale and the proceed of this money goes to uh, charity. Uh, and not just any charity, but um, I'm actually supporting the minority groups right now. Mm -hmm. So if you look at HIV AIDS um, in Malaysia, you will see that um, it's actually on an upward trend, mm -hmm. especially if you're looking against um, you know, HIV through transmission, through uh, sexual activities. So many years ago, um, you know, the injecting drug users are actually a major uh, contributing to the data and statistics of the upward trend. But a lot of things have, you know, I think we've got our act right in Malaysia when we uh, introduced the harm reduction program. Mm -hmm. So what they have done is that they have actually been giving free needles um, and governments, authorities has agreed not to prosecute, you know, NGOs who are going out and uh, giving drug users, you know, new, needle, new needles and all that. And of course, Drugs has also changed now. A lot of them are now moving towards designer drugs and all that. So not lesser injections. So we are seeing a, a huge uh, improvement. But over 90% of all cases now in Malaysia of HIV AIDS is through sexual activities. Mm -hmm. So, and when we talk about that, of course, um, you know, it can be quite uh, controversial when you talk about, you know, sex because is not just heterosexual, but you know, you, you want to solve that problem, yeah. you need to look at the entire uh, community, which includes the LGBTIQ community. So where, um, you know, as an organization myself, I have been supporting uh, transgender homes. So there is a transgender home I support, um, and we help build right after fire, which is called PKKUM, uh, Seed Foundation, uh, PT Foundation, the Pink Triangle Foundation, who works uh, with the MSM community. Uh, so there is a, a lot of these areas we have been channeling and I think over the last few years, uh, you know, we've channeled over a uh, million ringgit to all these charities. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we will continue to support this because we believe that if we want to solve the problem here in Malaysia, you need to look at minorities as well. Uh, MK, one final question. Um, Carex started as a small family business went through trials and tribulations, many, many challenges, and now it has become the world's largest uh, manufacturer of condom. Please give your advice to young people who are following this program on how they could face these challenges, this perseverance to continue to be a business. Please share with us. Well, um, I, I think a lot of people uh, need to focus the fact that, um, you know, success is a resultant of what you're doing. Um, you need to be you need to be passionate with what you're doing. Um, that means you know you have to look forward to what you're doing every day. It's the first thing in the morning is you know another great day. I just can't wait to get into the office to do something great. You know, so um, a lot of people always look at the resultant. They want to be successful. Everybody wants to be successful. Who who doesn't want to be? Yeah. But it's it's a passion to me. It's always the passion in business. Uh, in the passion that what you're doing. And of course, the moment you have that passion that's driving you, you know, whatever setbacks you get, it's just, you'll see that just as another way of maybe 
trying to do better next time. So um, have that passion and just continue to drive and believe in what you're doing. And you know, when people can see that, uh, the support will just come. Thank you, MK. Thank you uh, for sharing with us your, the kind of work that you do, which is really unusual. And we are proud that Carex is the number one in the world. Good from Malaysia. Thank you. Um, to all my followers, please remember to like, follow, and share Real Chun Wai. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, MK. Bye.